Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining today's onboard question and answer session for payers. Please keep your phone lines muted. We will be taking your questions through the chat box. When sending your questions in the chat box, send them to all panelists. Today we are joined by project leadership and subject matter experts from various areas of the Workers' Compensation Board. We'll start today with the new PAR search tab available for workload administrators. Then we will review the most common questions we have received from payers. I'll now turn it over to Pam from the Board's Public Information Office to begin. Thank you, Mike. Welcome, everyone. As Mike mentioned, uh, workload administrators have a new PAR search tab. Uh, this tab is where workload administrators can search the system for a few things, including number one, all in-flight PARs. Search results will return up to 10,000 of the most recent in-flight PAR records with PAR statuses updated in the last 30 days. This includes any PAR that needs a response, has been responded to, has been assigned by that workload administrator, or may require response in the future and is currently navigating the PAR process. Number two, all closed PARs. Search results will return up to 10,000 PAR records that were responded to or assigned by that workload administrator, completed the PAR process, and have a closed status in the last 30 days. And lastly, number three, custom PAR search. This allows the selection of specific criteria to retrieve desired results for any PAR the workload administrator needs to respond to, has assigned, has responded to, or may require response in the future. If a workload administrator for one organization is also a level one or level two reviewer for another organization for which they are not a workload admin, search results will only display PARs for organizations where they serve a workload administrator role. For example, PAR search results for this user will display only medication, DME and MTG non-MTG PARs for A insurance group and C group because this user holds the role of workload administrator for those PAR types submitted to these organizations. The PAR search results will not display any PARs for P insurance company because this user is only a medication level one reviewer for that organization. To use the various PAR search options, all you have to do is select the button next to the option you want, and then select Search. Custom PAR Search allows the workload administrator to narrow search results by entering specific search criteria. Searches can be done by entering data in one or more fields for PAR ID, PAR type, PAR status, patient last name, WCB case number, claim admin claim number, insurer ID, or provider name. Searches can also be done for PARs submitted during a specific date range, or for PARs with a status date within a specific date range. If a search result contains over 10,000 records, the system will not show results. You will be prompted to enter more specific search criteria to narrow the results. On the onboard training webpage for payers, Instructions for this new PAR search tab have been added to the Workload Administrator Dashboard Overview training webpage. This will provide details on how to use this new PAR search tab and what to expect when viewing results. That concludes the quick overview of the new PAR search feature. Next, we'll begin the question and answer session with some of the latest questions we've received regarding either phase one, two, or three of onboard. Question one, where should frequency and or duration be entered for applicable treatment? The board has received inquiries regarding where healthcare providers should be entering frequency and duration on prior authorization requests for applicable treatment. As part of every submission within onboard, the healthcare provider is required to enter or upload a statement of medical necessity and or medical supporting documentation. If their request includes therapeutic modalities, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, chiropractic, and or acupuncture services, they will include the specific frequency and duration of the requested treatment within the medical necessity field. 
If the request includes spinal levels, the specific spinal levels applicable to the request will be added to the medical necessity field. To locate this information, select the PAR ID link in your onboard dashboard. Select the medical necessity section or scroll down until you reach that section of the web page. The frequency and or duration information will be available here. Remember, if you need more information from the healthcare provider, you can use the Request for Further Information or RFI function. Question two, can you edit a PAR response if it was filed incorrectly? After the level one or level two reviewer submits a grant in PAR or denial for any PAR type except medication, the reviewer can change the response from a grant in PAR or denial to a grant. Changing the response can only be done for administrative, jurisdiction, or IME-related denial. This can be done by the Level 1 reviewer until the Level 2 reviewer has submitted a response. It can be done by a Level 2 reviewer until the time that the Level 3, or the Board Medical Director's Office, issues a notice of resolution. To change the response, select the PAR ID link in your dashboard. Then, if your PAR response can be changed, you can select Action and Change Response. Next question here, are orders of the chair automatically generated? Yes, orders of the chair are automatically generated for non-medication PARs in Onboard. Question four, is a PAR Level 1 response required before it can receive a Level 2 response? Yes. All PAR submissions will first require a Level 1 reviewer to provide a response. If the PAR is denied or granted in part at the Level 1 review for any PAR other than medication, the PAR will automatically escalate to a Level 2 review. Question 5. How can the payer attach information to a response? After the payer has provided their response to the PAR and entered applicable information, like claim apportionment information, they can attach any supporting documentation at the end of their submission. Entering this information is the final step before reviewing and submitting the response. After uploading an attachment to your response, you can still use the Save as Draft button to save your response to your Draft eForms tab. The attachment will save within your drafted eForm until you complete the request from your Draft eForms tab. Question six, if a PAR is sent to the incorrect payer, what should we do? In the event that you believe a PAR was sent to the wrong payer, a response to that PAR is still required. A non-response will still result in an order of the chair. Question seven, how should the payer respond if the attached medical is outdated or stale? There is no administrative denial reason related to the supporting medical. If the payer believes the attached medical does not support what is being requested in the PAR, then a statement to that effect should be part of the rationale when it denies the PAR for medical reasons. Any denial for medical reasons requires a level two response. Next question here, what should we do if a provider attaches irrelevant supporting medical documentation? If the healthcare provider adds or attaches irrelevant or incorrect medical documentation to the PAR, the payer should submit a Request for Further Information, or RFI, stating the incorrect document was attached and requesting that the correct medical documentation be sent in response to the RFI. If there is no response to the RFI, the payer can deny the PAR and state the reasons for lack of supporting medical. The healthcare provider can then submit a new PAR. That covers our top questions received from the payer community. Thank you everybody for your time today. For the remainder of today's webinar, we'll answer questions submitted via chat. So I'll now turn it over to Mike to begin that portion. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. When sending a question in chat, make sure you send it to all panelists. We'll take a brief moment now to review the questions submitted and we will be back shortly. Hi everyone, this is Audrey Cunningham from the Medical Director's Office. Um, the first question is, if I'm a level one reviewer and need to escalate the PAR up to a level two, is it, is it proper to deny the PAR? Um, 
Yes, it, it, it is proper to, de to deny if that's what you would like to do, and that will automatically be escalated to level two. Hi, this is James Wessel with the Claims Operations Division. We have a couple of questions about MTG confirmation or MG1 PARs and um, how to handle those if there's an IME pending or the payer feels that an IME is needed, uh, in particular when there are, the treatment is for a body part that hasn't been accepted or established for the claim. Um, the time frame to respond to those PARs is the time frame to respond to those PARs. There's no mechanism to extend the time frame, so a response is needed within eight business days to avoid an order of the chair. If the payer believes that the treatment requested should be denied because it's not related to the, what is the claim is established or accepted for, that would be a, a appropriate basis for denial, but that's a level two medical determination and not a level one denial. There's a question why certain uh, payer responses for uh, denials or grant and parts are not included in e-case. Uh, for most auto-escalated requests from L1 to L2, uh, there is not an L1 document uh, generated, so it is not placed in the e-case. Uh, once that L2 reviewer responds, uh, all the attachments in the L1 and L2 responses that are captured would be placed into uh, EK. Uh, there's a question as to whether or not the dose can be added as a required field in the medication request. Um, there is a field called uh, medication slash uh, name and strength that the provider field uh, fills out. Um, it is one of the uh, drop downs um, within the medication part. Are physical therapists permitted to request a part for treatment? Uh, physical therapists uh, are only uh, allowed to submit uh, requests for treatment uh, not addressed in the MTGs, so non MTG uh, PARs over or under $1,000. Uh, physical therapists cannot submit uh, PARs for variances or special services. And then um, another question regarding MTG confirmations and body parts not established. Uh, while it is certainly the payer's right to deny the PAR um, at level two because the body part is not established, so the treatment isn't appropriate to the claim, the payer may also opt to grant that treatment without prejudice. But that, again, is an option that's only available to the level two reviewer. The only basis a level one reviewer can grant without prejudice is if the claim is currently controverted and they can point to a FROIO 4 or SHROIO 4 that's in the file. And then uh, we have a question about PARs that where a response from the payer is due this coming Monday, June 20th, because that's a New York State holiday. Um, and whether PARs are still due on that date. And those responses, that depends on the PAR type. Uh, most two PAR types, MTG confirmation and non-MTG related under $1,000, the response is calculated in business days, so there should be no PARs that are due on June 20th. Most other PAR types where the response is calendar days, it's actually calendar days as defined in the general construction law where if the due date falls on a weekend or holiday, it moves to the next business day. So those PARs for MTG variants, MTG special services, DME, um, and non-MTG over $1,000, anything that should be due on June 20th is going to end up due on June 21st. The one exception to that are medication PARs, which is the response time frame is calculated in calendar days, regardless of holidays or weekends. So any medication PARs that are due on June 20th, the response is due on June 20th. There's a question regarding medication requests and uh, payments for those medication requests are processed through the onboard system itself. Uh, they are not onboard is just to request prior authorization or to submit the HP1s for uh, billing disputes. Uh, there is no payment processing within the onboard system itself. Uh, there's a question as to uh, what to do um, when a, a 
Car is submitted for a knee arthroplasty. Um, it's submitted on an MPG confirmation. Um, if there is uh, <clears throat> if there is a PAR submitted for something that should in fact be a variance PAR or a special services PAR, um, the MTG confirmation PAR should be denied. We have a question about what happens if a PAR is granted in error by the provider by the payer, and if there's any opportunity or functionality to change a response. And there is not. Once a PAR has been granted, the payer cannot change their response. Uh, there's a question as to whether a PAR can be denied if no medical is su submitted, and the answer is yes. The provider does need to submit, submit supporting documentation. We have a question about the documents that should be sent to the claimant when the, when the payer is sending, is sending them a copy of their response. And the expectation is that the claimant is provided with the same response that is provided to the provider, and that ends up in the board file. So that would be the response form from OBLR plus any attachments. Uh, there's a question as to the response time for MTG confirmations. Uh, MTG confirmation um, PARs uh, do need to be responded uh, within uh, eight days. Um, otherwise, uh, they will, in order of the chair, uh, will be issued. Uh, there's a question about um, request for further information, and the, the payer, or as a reminder, the payer has the ability to request further information. The provider should respond, and at every opportunity, we will provide information to the providers and go over with them how they should respond and the importance of responding. But none of that changes the time frame for response. So if you do not get a response and you don't have enough information or the information you have doesn't support the request, it, the payer should deny the request. And generally, those are probably going to be for medical reasons and um, the most appropriate rationale that you think is applicable. Uh, just a follow-up question with respect to the MTG confirmation. Um, the claim administrator um, in responding um, must also send the injured worker notice of the approval, partial approval, or denial of the MTG confirmation part. Uh, there's a question about archived cases in um, e-case and um, how to handle those. Um, payers shouldn't be denying PARs because a case is archived. We ultimately, if case information needs to be updated, the, the payer can contact the board and we can restore the case and update the information. Or um, well, that's probably the best mechanism. And once the case is restored, if the carrier files the appropriate Broy or Stroy, that information can also be updated that way. Uh, we have a question about apportion claims. And the system will assign the PAR to the primary, who the board has designated as the primary insurer, um, who is the insurer for who the board has identified as the primary employer, except in a case where the apportioned carrier is the one making all the payments and doing all the filings. So there. There's a question about duplicate cases, and there are instances where um, the board will, because information is received at different times from different sources and in slightly different manners, set up cases that should probably be, uh, that are probably duplicates and should be combined. Our recommendation would be that the payer contact the board and ask that the cases be reviewed for a cancel and combine. And if ultimately you have a PAR that's on a case that has since been canceled, that would be an administrative, administrative basis for you to deny the PAR if you feel that that's the appropriate response. And on a related note with canceled and combined cases, providers are not able to submit PARs on cases that have been canceled at the time they submit the PAR. But if the payer identifies that the case should be canceled upon receiving the PAR or should be combined with another case and asks the board to look into that, that may be the reason why a PAR that was submitted may, be, may be need to be denied for that reason after the fact. 
Uh, this is Dr. Tachi. The question is, if an IME was completed prior to receipt of a PAR request for a treatment and the IME addresses the request, um, is the IME still valid um, or is a new IME needed? Um, that's sort of a two-part answer. Um, if the IME has already been done and it specifically addresses the clinical question that's being uh, asked for in the PAR, whether it's a medication or surgery, et cetera, um, and there's been no uh, significant clinical status change uh, of the patient between the time of the IME and the time of the PAR request, and if they're close in time and there's been no, no status change, then that IME could still be used. If you use that IME, of course, um, you would not get the 30-day, um, the extension to 30 days for the response because you don't have to schedule and perform an IME. The IME has already been performed. I, we have a question about um, when an insurance carrier receives a PAR for a new claim that they would intend to have managed by a third-party administrator. And on, unfortunately or realistically, the board can only route PARs to claim administrators based on the information we have at the time. So if we don't have a TPA on notice, it's going to end up with the insurance carrier who is responsible for responding to that PAR. If to avoid recurrences of that of PARs being routed that way, you're gonna want your TPAs to file the appropriate Freud transaction as soon as possible. There's a question, are out-of-state providers required to use the uh, onboard system? Yes, uh, they can visit the board website, uh, register as an out-of-state provider with their uh, MPI. And as long as there are provider types, such as, for example, a physician, uh, MP, physician's assistant, uh, we will grant them access to the system and they'll be able to submit prior authorization requests through onboard. Uh, there's a question about uh, DME requests and the uh, due date, whether it's uh, days or hours. Uh, it is days, uh, it's four days. Uh, don't forget that the first day is day zero. Uh, it then counts four days out uh, for DME requests. Uh, if that fourth day falls on a weekend, it will go to the next uh, business day. Uh, if, for example, though, they submit on a Monday and day four is Friday, uh, it will count out and be due on that uh, Friday. We also have another question uh, about PT providers and can they submit uh, PARs or does that be submitted by a doctor? Uh, physical therapists are able to submit non-MTG PARs for uh, under, equal, or over 1,000. Uh, they cannot submit anything uh, related to MTG, such as a variance, confirmation, or special services. Uh, there's another question about IMEs, and it states, if an IME recommends cessation of PT, and we receive a PT request, can we deny the request administratively? Um, and the answer is no, the, the request would still be denied based, it'd be a medical denial, and your level one and level two reviewers could cite the IME's findings uh, as part of their denial of the request. And those findings would also be available on level three review if the provider requests it. There's a uh, question about how PARs get routed to a medical review vendor, whether that happens automatically after the level one denial. Uh, if that payer has designated an MRO for their level two reviews, uh, by designated, I mean the online administrators went in and chosen an MRO from the dropdown in their administrator screen. Uh, yes, it will automatically route to that MRO's dashboard and the MRO's workload administrator can then assign the request to one of their reviewers. Uh, just an important note for payers, a copy of that PAR is always placed on your dashboard as well. So if you have a workload administrator for that PAR type, uh, you do have the ability if for some reason it's a sensitive request, uh, the contract terminates with a MRO vendor or something like that, uh, you do have the ability to pull that PAR and respond to it directly as the payer is desired. Uh, we have a question where a payer has noticed where some providers are doing a PAR request for one item, 
but then including a second item in their explanation, their statement of medical necessity. Um, that the statement of medical necessity is a free form text field, so the provider could put something there. But if the payer did not respond, anything included in that would not be part of the order of the chair. So ultimately, the if the payer wants to grant that item, it certainly would be within their capability. But if it whether you respond or not, that isn't really a valid part of the request. Um, hi, my name is Melissa. I'm one of the panelists. There's a question that says, how are confirmations able to come through without an MTG selected? Uh, we get a lot of these. That is something that actually has been corrected and you should no longer be receiving confirmation PARs with a none code. Um, so it shouldn't be an issue going forward. Uh, there's another question regarding L2 reviewer qualifications. If the reviewer is not licensed uh, in the state of New York, is work, worker com, workers comp board certification uh, necessary? So the requirement uh, for L2 physician reviewers is that they're licensed in the state where they're located. Um, they do not have to be authorized by the New York State uh, workers comp board, uh, but they, they do have to be registered with the onboard system in order to conduct the reviews. Another question with respect to the physical therapists. Um, so, uh, with respect to MTG confirmations and variances, those would be uh, par submitted by the treating physician. Uh, so, the treating physician um, can submit those pars for physical therapy, not the physical therapist um, themselves. Uh, there's a question can an L2 reviewer be an RN? The answer is no, uh, it has to be a physician reviewer uh, licensed in their state. Hi, there's a question that says, if a request is received for physical therapy to cervical spine, however, specific frequency and duration is not provided, um, but the IME supports physical therapy, can we approve it? Um, the answer is yes, you can indicate the frequency and duration that you are approving um, in your decision. Um, there's a couple of questions regarding duplicates, and uh, as a reminder, OBLR will not let the pro same provider submit the same request on the same claim while there is a live PAR, and, that and the period that a PAR is live includes the time period by which they can escalate after the fact. If after that time period the provider resubmits the same PAR, it would be incumbent upon the payer to review that PAR and respond as they did to the first one. Uh, there's a question with respect to a denial of an MTG confirmation on whether or not that will be automatically escalated to level two, and the answer is yes, it will be escalated to level two if denied. There's a couple questions about the provider not providing either enough documentation or enough information up front or enough or responding to a request for further information and how the payer would deny the PAR. And if the provider fails to justify their request as medically necessary, the payer can deny with their medical rationale that the request is not supported. There's a question, uh, if a prescriber submits a med PAR for in-office knee injection, should it be denied because it requires an MTG variance instead? So uh, this is kind of a twofold question. So if the, uh, if the injection requires a variance, then the provider would have to submit a variance uh, request. But if the patient is picking up the injection as a medication from their pharmacy, then it also requires a medication PAR. If the provider is giving the injection from their supply at the office and the, and the patient is not picking it up from the pharmacy, then a medication PAR is not required. Uh, there's a question about copies to the claimant's attorney and the claimant. Um, as a refresher, on board when you set the onboard limit release, when you submit your response, it will send a copy to the provider it will deposit a copy in the board's case holder visible by eCase, and if the claimant has an attorney who is properly on notice and registered, 
they will be notified that there's a document in the case. The payer's only responsibility is to send a manual copy of the documents to the claimant. Hi, there's a question with respect to um, the differences between an MG1 confirmation and MTG variant and MTG special services. Um, with respect to um, MTG variances, when a treating uh, provider determines that the medical care varies from the medical treatment guidelines, that provider can submit uh, an MTG variant. Um, that's similar to an MTG um, special services par, um, and those special services um, are somewhat uh, more complicated procedures such as lumbar fusions and hypoplasties, so they are listed um, in Section 324 um, of um, Section uh, 12 of the New York uh, uh, Rules and Regs. Uh, and lastly, with respect to MTG confirmations, that's a type of PAR um, when a uh, treating physician um, wants to uh, confirm consistency with the medical treatment guidelines. And just, just to add briefly to that, the, the special services uh, PARs can be consistent with the medical treatment guidelines. So the procedure requested uh, does not necessarily have to be a variance from the, the treatment guidelines. They can be uh, recommended within the medical treatment guidelines, but those specific uh, procedures still require the special services PAR, typically because of their complexity, et cetera. There is a uh, question about due dates and uh, the time specifically when they're due. Uh, if there's any way for a provider to mark it as time sensitive, uh, so it's due earlier in the day, there is not. Uh, all PARs would expire at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time on the due date. Uh, they would not expire in, for example, the middle of the afternoon. Uh, there's a question about the time frame for responding to injured workers. Uh, for sending, co I'm sorry, sending copies of the PAR response to the claimant. And the expectation is that <coughs> the response to the provider that's sent through OBLR and the copy that is sent to the claimant will be performed as close together as is reasonably possible. Uh, there is a follow-up question with respect to a payer's response to MTG confirmation. Um, and while MTG confirmation uh, PARs are optional on the part of the provider, um, payers do in fact need to respond to uh, MTG confirmation PARs. There's a question that says when you approve PT, when no frequency duration is specified, is that a grant or a grant in part? Uh, technically it could be either as long as you specify the frequency and duration that you're approving. There's a question about the new uh, PAR search function for workload administrators and what the definition of submission date and PAR status date are. Uh, submission date would be the date that that request was initially submitted. So, for example, if an L1 request was submitted on uh, June 1st, uh, we reflect June 1st, the PAR status date changes uh, each time that the status is uh, updated. So, for example, if the carrier denies that L1 request on June 5th, uh, the PAR status date would be June 5th on that request. Uh, the reason uh, we do that is uh, that way it will stay in that uh, open search uh, for the last uh, 30 days when you're uh, retrieving those requests. And also related to responses that are being sent to the claimant, the requirement to notify the claimant is only of a the decision that actually goes back to the provider. So if there's a DME PAR that's denied for medical reasons at level one and is auto escalated to level two, there's nothing that needs to go to the claimant. It would be the level two response that goes back to the provider and is visible in each case that would need to go to the claimant. And there's a couple of questions about whether a provider can cancel or retract a PAR, and they cannot. There is no functionality for the provider to withdraw a request once it's been submitted. Uh, regarding IMEs, if you, receive, if you have an IME scheduled, 
and you receive an MTG variance or MTG special services PAR, and the time frame and the the IME doesn't fall within the 15 days you have to respond, but it does fall within the 30 days. You can use the request IME function to extend the time frame to 30 days and then base your response on that IME. But if your IME is already outside of the 30-day window, that doesn't change the fact that you have 15 or 30 days to respond to that PAR. Uh, there's a question about a provider submitting a PAR that the payer believes is a duplicate of something they've already responded to, and what happens if they do not respond to the second PAR, and the answer is an order of the chair will be issued. Uh, there's a question about a case that's subject to a third-party settlement, but the documentation isn't necessarily in eCase yet to refer to by doc ID. So you could attach those documents to your PAR response in lieu of referring to the e-case doc ID and date. Uh, there's a question about the notice of resolution regarding treatment. The board issues the notice of resolution regarding treatment, so the board provides a copy to the claimant. The payer's responsibility is to notify the claimant of their response to a PAR. Same with order of the chair. If an order of the chair is issued, the board through OB, the board notifies the claimant that an order of the chair has been issued. There's a question that says there's no free text box to communicate the frequency duration to the provider. Um, actually, in the training, if you look um, under payer training, uh, under grant in part, if you select grant in part as the drop down, it will open up a box and it says rationale for grant in part, where you can specify what you would like to approve. And speaking of the training, um, one of the other things that was covered was that payer responses to medication PARs do not need to be sent to the claimant. Those are the only PAR responses that do not need to be sent to the claimant. There's a question about uh, PAR search uh, and for payers and who has that ability. Uh, it is the workload administrator uh, for that payer or MRO that has the uh, PAR search. Uh, reviewers do not have uh, the PAR search capability. There's also a question about what uh, browsers are supported for onboard. Uh, currently, Edge Chromium, which is the blue and green E, Chrome, in Firefox, as well as Safari, if you're using an Apple Mac, are all supported browsers. Internet Explorer 11 and the older version of Edge, which is the Bluey, are not supported. Uh, so you may encounter issues if you use an unsupported browser with Onboard. So there still seems to be some confusion about notification to the injured worker of a payer response. Number one, payers only need to send their responses with the attachments to the claimant. They do not need to send orders of the chair or notices of resolution, and the expectation is that those responses are sent timely relative to when the response is sent in OBLR. The, the only responses where a, something doesn't need to be sent is medication parts all six other PAR types, the response needs to be sent. If the claimant has an attorney, the payer does not need to send a response to the attorney because they will, if properly registered and configured, receive an email notifying them that they can review the response in each case. But even if the claimant has an attorney, the response must still be sent to them. There was a couple of requests for a copy of today's slides. And Following the webinar this week, we will be sending all attendees an email which will contain a link to the slides used as well as a recording of today's presentation. And in addition to that, the recording of the webinar and the slides will be available on the payers training web pages and on the payers resources web pages. So with that, we will conclude today's webinar. Um, for full details and instructions, please see the updated training web pages for payers. If you need assistance with onboard registration or technical support, email WCB customer support 
at wcb.ny.gov. If you need assistance with onboard processes, email the board's medical director's office at wcbmedicaldirectorsoffice at wcb.ny.gov. And for all other questions, please email onboard at wcb.ny.gov. At the closing of this webinar, you will be linked to a survey. Your input here is greatly appreciated as it will help us plan and improve future sessions and update our onboard resources. Thank you all again for participating today and have a wonderful day.